Scripture reading before today's lesson will come from Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said these also should be set before them. And they ate, and they were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. You may be seated. Good morning. Great to be with you today. Thank you so much for your attendance today. I don't think we have quite the crowd that we had last week, but it's a good crowd today. Uh, and it's good because we're here, right? We are good because God has made us good, justified. Um, we have a lot of people who have been hanging out with us for a lot of weeks in a row. Uh, I'm especially thinking of Sydney and Caleb. If you haven't met them, please do. Uh, and Caleb's brother, Aaron, is with us today. So we have Caleb and Aaron. And I hope you met the folks in front of you here. We have Luke and Mary and Levi to come soon. Mark is over here, Joseph is here, Joshua's back in the back, I'm James, there's Elizabeth, I just love people with Bible names, that's fun to me. So I'm just going to throw this out there, not, no pressure. For those who have been visiting with us for several weeks, we don't do a very good job sometimes of telling people how they can become a member of this church. And what you need to do is go talk to one of our elders. And we'll have an elder who will uh, lead the closing prayer today. So just go to one of the elders, or if you prefer to come to me, I'll go to the elders for you and let them know that, hey, these people want to be put to work in the kingdom of God. And we'll acknowledge you in some way. And who knows we have a pretty good tradition here that we haven't lived by in more than a year and that is to sing our new members into the congregation so we kind of need to get back to that i think um glad everybody's here today we're gonna start this morning by completing the story that luke just started for us but we're going to be in mark chapter 8 starting with verse 11 where it says the pharisees came and began to argue with Jesus, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit and says, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Now, they, the 12, had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And Jesus cautioned them saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, 12. 
and the seven for the 4,000. How many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And Jesus said to them, do you not yet understand? When Deborah and I lived in Southern California, we went to the home of some church friends. And before she brought out the main spread of food, she brought bread to the table and it was really good. And she said, this is friendship bread because we're having our friends here for supper. And then at the end of the meal, she brought Deborah a little baggie full of starter. She said, here's some starter for you. Why don't you take this home and make your own batch of bread and give it to your friends? And Deborah did. That's what we do when we make friendship bread. We take a little of this starter, leaven, and we make a batch of dough and we take the leaven and we work it into the dough. We knead it into the dough. And before you know it, the leaven has worked its way throughout the entire lump of dough. And you throw it in your loaf pan, stick it in the oven, and in a little wad, you're going to have some very tasty bread. But before you bake those loaves, you take aside another amount and you set it aside to do what? To decay, to ferment. That's what leaven is. It is decaying dough, fermenting. Now, in Scripture, when you think about bread, it's usually shown in a positive light. Bread, a staple of every diet in the ancient Near East. Bread is important. In the Old Testament, God, you remember, brought manna from heaven to sustain Israel in the desert for 40 years. It was there every morning, like clockwork, except on the Sabbath. Bread from heaven. And then Jesus calls himself the bread of life. And so in the Bible, bread most of the time is a very positive thing. It is tasty, it's wholesome, and it gives life. Leaven, on the other hand, is just the opposite. Scripture usually presents leaven in a negative light, and that's really true in this morning's text, isn't it? Look at verse 15 again. And Jesus cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Jesus is talking about starter, the little piece of dough that's been set aside to rot for a while. Jesus is saying, Watch out for the rotting dough of the Pharisees and the Herodians. Now, since you've been reading through your Old Testament, you know that once a year the Jews are required to go through their kitchens and to clear out every bit of leaven in the house. Get it out. And start over with a fresh batch of bread that has no leaven in it. This would be flat bread, what we might call a pita, typically in Scripture called unleavened bread, like the communion bread that we ate just moments ago. And this annual event in Judaism came to be known as the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, and it coincided with the Passover festival. And so at Passover, they would eat unleavened bread along with the Passover lamb. And this is why we have unleavened bread at the Lord's table every first day of the week. Jesus was eating the Passover meal with the 12 on the night he was betrayed. He broke the unleavened bread and he blessed it and he passed it to the disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body. Symbolically, leaven has a corrupting influence. And that's why it's used negatively in Scripture. That's why you clean it out of your house. And in fact, there's an ancient proverb that Paul comes along later and puts in one of his letters. He writes, don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? And that's a proverb that's full of truth. It's true as you work that bread, you bring in the leaven and you knead the bread and it only takes a little bit, but it works its way throughout the entire lump of dough. 
but it's also true of life. A little leaven will leaven the whole lump. In other words, evil always spreads and it will damage everything it touches. And so in our text for today, Jesus talks about bread and he talks about leaven. Last week, you remember, we left Jesus in Gentile territory. He is east of the Jordan River. Chapter 8, what we're in today, finds Jesus now surrounded by 4,000 people. People who have been with him, the text says, for three days and they've had nothing to eat. And Jesus cares about that. And we're going, hold on a minute. I think Jim preached this sermon a few weeks ago. This seems very familiar. Haven't we heard this story already? Something like this has already happened, hasn't it? And Jesus even reminds the 12 of that. There's a massive amount of people here with nothing to eat, just like before. And in verse 2, Jesus says, I have compassion on the crowd because they've been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they'll faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. Hmm. What to do? We got a real problem on our hands, guys. What should we do about it? And Jesus waits for the response from the 12. And it's the wrong response. Verse 4, and his disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? This really does sound familiar, doesn't it? And it should. This has already happened on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. On the other side of the lake, Jesus fed 5,000 Jewish patriots with five loaves of bread. That crowd, you remember, had come in response to the preaching of the 12. These people are ready to follow Jesus into battle. And Jesus had compassion on them. And he fed them. The crowd here in Mark 8 is a different crowd, a lot different. These people are not Jews. These people are Gentiles. And they are not responding to the preaching of the 12 because the 12 have not been preaching to them because the 12 don't want to preach to them. They're responding because they've heard about Jesus. They've heard of his miracles. And they have come to seek him out, 4,000 Gentiles. Now, we got to be honest, don't we? It's very hard for us to believe that the 12 can't make this connection because it's obvious, isn't it? I mean, we got the big crowd, we got a big problem, we got no food, what are we going to do? They ought to know the answer to the problem with ease, but they don't. Why? Well, you remember the answer to that question that we got on the other side of the lake? Hard-heartedness. They have hard hearts. And they're really hard against this group of people, these filthy, pagan Gentiles. I mean, last week, Jesus called a Syrophoenician woman a dog. And the 12 are thinking, yeah, that's right. Good one, Jesus. We're the chosen ones. Jews first, not Gentiles. And then Jesus brings them back across Galilee and goes to the other side of the lake, to the 10 cities, the Decapolis. And there Jesus, remember you heard it last week, he heals this deaf man by putting his fingers in the man's ears and he spits on the ground and grabs his tongue that guy was a gentile see jesus is teaching a lesson that the kingdom of the heavens is not just for jews it's for everybody 
Jesus is teaching them, my kingdom is not what you expect, and its doors are going to be open wide for everybody, but the 12 don't get it because in their mind, there is a huge difference between Jew and Gentile. Jesus has come to do something new. And these 12 are going to play a huge role in what he's doing, but first they have to be taught. And so Jesus repeats on the Gentile side of the lake what he did on the Jewish side of the lake, and he does it in the exact same way. And again, the 12 are the ones who do all the work. Jesus says, count the loaves. How many you got? Well, this time they have seven. That's a good number. It's a number in Judaism of completion, perfection, fullness. And notice there are more loaves for the Gentiles than there were for the Jews. There were a thousand more Jews on the other side of the lake, but they had less bread. Here there's less people and more bread. And again, Jesus has all the people sit down and he breaks the loaves and he offers thanks. And again, they have a few small fish to go around as well. He blesses those and everything is distributed to this huge crowd of people just like it was before. It's a very familiar story. And after the people get their fill, Jesus tells the 12 to go take up the leftovers. And now the first time this happened on the Jewish side of the lake, you remember how many baskets were left over? 12, right? One for each of the apostles. 12 is a good number in Scripture. It represents the people of God. 12 tribes, 12 apostles. This time they pick up seven baskets of leftovers. Again, the number of fullness and completeness. Jesus is teaching the 12 that the days of Jews only are going to come to an end very soon because God wants everybody. He wants them all. After they meal, they jump in the boat, they head back to Galilee, and upon their arrival, guess who shows up? Those pesky Pharisees. And we've kind of learned by now that when the Pharisees show up, nothing good is gonna happen because all they wanna do is criticize Jesus. They see Jesus as violating their traditions, and so they're keeping their eye on him. And when he does something they don't like, they spread the word. This guy's bad news. And in fact, they've gone so far as to declare that Jesus gets his miraculous powers from Satan. And now here they are again. Look at verse 11. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit and says, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given this generation. They ask for a sign. Jesus gives them a sigh. In fact, Jesus has already done multiple signs in multiple locations you see, the problem for the Pharisees is not a lack of signs. Their problem is corruption and decay in their hearts. Their decayed hearts will not allow them to see what Jesus is doing. And on the occasion that they do see a little bit of it, they call it the work of Satan because their hearts are corrupt. You see, when your heart is hard, the evidence doesn't matter. Your mind is already made up. That's the Pharisees. And when your heart is hard, you don't help people. You hurt people. Evil hearts, full of decay. That's a dangerous heart condition. And Jesus doesn't want any part of it because he knows that decay spreads. And so Jesus and the 12 get back in the boat. 
And notice what Jesus says to the disciples, verse 15, and he cautions them saying, watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees. And the 12 are clueless. Jesus is chewing us out again because we didn't bring enough food. We forgot to bring our bread. See, they're taking Jesus literally, but they're not taking him seriously. The 12 only have one loaf of bread among 13 people in the boat, and their topic of conversation, can you believe this, is lack of bread. What are we going to do? They're worried about bread. Jesus warns them about leaven. Verse 17, and this will be the harshest rebuke Jesus gives to the 12 that we've seen thus far. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not perceive or understand? Are your hearts that hard? You have eyes, but you don't see. You have ears, you don't hear. Do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the five thousands, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? Twelve. And the seven loaves for the four thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? Seven. And Jesus said to them, do you not yet understand? See, if they had been paying attention, they would know that bread is no problem for Jesus. Jesus can do wonderful things with bread. It's not a problem. But leaven, leaven on the other hand is a big problem. And they should be reminded of that every time they bump into the Pharisees or the Herodians or any of the other groups that are opposed to Jesus. Jesus wants the 12 to see that the influence of the Pharisees is a dangerous thing and it can spread into their hearts too if they're not careful. And to be honest with you, on some level it already has. Leaven is a big problem. You can have leaven around and completely forget that it's there, or worse, you pretend that it's not really there. You just kind of ignore the leaven. Let's not think about that. But the influence always spreads. Churches and individual Christians have a bad habit of worrying about the bread. We worry if we're going to have enough. We worry about having the right kind. We're concerned about the texture and the softness and the appearance and the color. And I'm talking about things like buildings and budgets and bulletins and staffing and seating and sound and lighting and literature. We worry that our YouTube feed is not going to be as good as the church across town. We have so many things that are important to us. So many things that we're so concerned about that we're worried sick. Is it enough? Is it too much? Or is it just right? And church, if we have a bad habit of worrying about bread, we have an equally bad habit of not worrying about leaven. The evil that resides in our hearts our attitudes, our insecurities, our immaturity, our selfishness, our sex, our greed, our politics, our hatred, our prejudice. These are the things that reside in our hearts and they make us self-righteous and argumentative and uncompromising. These are the things that cause us not to help people but to actually hurt people. The things that are hidden in our hearts, things we just really don't take that seriously. It's the leaven that goes unrepented 
and continues to ferment and rot and it influences everything it touches. Jesus says that preoccupation of material things trivializes discipleship. Corrupt hearts deny the very essence of what it means to really follow Jesus. Because the kingdom of God is about internal transformation, a transformation of heart that turns into a transformation of behavior and attitude and character. And when we lose that, when we forget that, we get too preoccupied with stuff Stuff that in the big picture just doesn't really matter. Church bread's not a problem for Jesus. Leaven, on the other hand, destroys. Well, as we go through the life of Jesus, we're going to find him continuing to knock heads with these Pharisees. And in the end, they're going to murder him. It's a one-point sermon today. If you would, write it down and take it home and think about it this afternoon. Folks, we got to get a lot more focused on the evil leaven that's in our hearts and trust Jesus to take care of the bread. Because you know what? If we don't, we're no better than the Pharisees. We will indeed be the Pharisees if we don't get serious about the evil that resides in our hearts. We will be like the Pharisees if we stay focused on the external things and allow the internal leaven to continue to do its evil work inside of us. But if we will be diligent to clean out the leaven if we will search out every nook and cranny of our heart for any trace of leaven and repent of it and acknowledge it before God and confess it to one another, oh, Jesus has already shown us that he has no problem supply, supplying the bread. He'll give us everything we need to do his work in Central Texas. But in today's text, Jesus calls us to only do one thing. Watch out. Beware of the leaven. Watch out. Let's close with a prayer. Father, we give you honor and glory for the word that we've received this morning. We pray, Father, that you will remove the hard, crusty, rotten leaven from our hearts. That your indwelling spirit will transform our hearts into hearts that look just like the heart of your son. Father, may we cast aside our prejudices and our traditions and our greeds and our selfishness and replace those things with the fruit of your Holy Spirit, good things like love and joy and peace, and kindness and goodness, patience and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Father, we pray that your spirit of grace would help us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, that we would live lives that honor you while we wait patiently for Jesus to appear, to take us home, to be in your presence forever. We pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. As always, if there's anyone here this morning who is ready to give their life to Jesus and submit to baptism to have all your sins washed away, we hope that today would be the day of your salvation. Find me, find one of the elders. 
We'll get that taken care of today. If we have anyone here this morning who would like to pray privately uh, with one of the elders, with me, my wife, uh, just come and find us at the end of service. We'll head off to one of these rooms in the back and pray together. I love you, church. Thank you for your kind attention this morning. At this time, one of our shepherds, Brother Scott Ellison, will come and lead us in prayer.